I'm Dean. I'm the dad. I'm Laura. I'm the mom. And I'm Crystal. And I'm the daughter. And together we are Thank Family you. Plot. Very nice. Very nice. Um, thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my beautiful lady, my daughter, I love you both. Let's get into the housekeeping. Uh, first and foremost, there's Patreon. We have two levels, $1 and $3. Um, we're going to try one more time, I believe, to do something a little special with our, uh, our Patreon. Um, but not today, necessarily, because I don't have a good idea right now. But we'll, we will do something soon. Uh, just remember that... I got it. Okay. If we get in Noom... Is it three dollars or one and two? We've got one dollar and three dollars. Those are our. Okay. So if we get ten new three dollar Patreon members. Why don't we put those ten Patreon members' names into a hat and do a drawing and invite the one who wins the drawing to come and be a guest on an episode of Family? Sounds like a plan to me. Want to be an epi- Want a chance at being a guest on an episode? Sign up for our new three dollar level. Level. I like that. That works. Uh, if you cannot do a monthly donation, which is what Patreon is, you can always do a single donation of a dollar or two through Buy Me a Coffee. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please share it on social media. Share it with friends. Share it with family. With everyone. And if you don't enjoy the show, please. Keep, Keep it, it to, to yourself. yourself. So what are we talking about today, Dean? Well, today we look at three more fairy tales, examining their origins and then, and adaptations in this heavy folklore episode of the Family Plot Podcast. I uh, will be looking into three stories tonight, Snow White, Pinocchio, and Hansel and Gretel. Uh, these tales all have a fascinating history, and we will begin with Snow White. <laughs> I get to see a Snow White story. <laughs> Once upon a time, a queen gave birth to a young girl, and her skin was as white as snow. Her lips were as red as roses, and her hair was as black as night. Her mother named her Snow White. For the color of her skin, and loved her very much before she came ill, became very ill and passed away. Within a few years, the king met and married a new wife. The new wife didn't care for children, nor did she care for the people of the kingdom. The only things she did care for were magic and being the most beautiful. In fact, She had a magic mirror that she would ask every morning. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the most beautiful of them all? And the mirror would respond, your beauty is as welcome as fresh air. You are even the most fair. Of course, like any other children, the queen also had no love of Snow White and could see that the child was growing up to be quite beautiful. Soon, as Snow White was on the cusp of adulthood, the queen woke one morning and went to her mirror to say, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the most beautiful of them all? And the mirror responded honestly, You 
are the most beautiful in this room is true but no white has grown much fairer than you the queen grew angry and summoned a huntsman she knew the queen told the huntsman that he was to take Snow White out into the woods, kill her, and cut out her heart as proof to return to the queen. The huntsman collected the child and went on a long walk, fascinated by her beauty and kind ways. Finally, he broke down and told her the truth. The queen had ordered her death. The huntsman refused to take her life and told her never to return to the castle. He left her, killed a pig, and took its heart to the queen. No white was left to fend for herself. She soon came upon a small house. Inside, she found a small table with seven little chairs. There were seven little beds, and everything in the home was small size, as made for smaller people. Snow White loved it, and when the owners came home, seven little men who worked in the local mine, they were enchanted by Snow White's beauty and chose to share the cottage with her. She and the little men worked out a system where she would clean for them and cook meals while they toiled in the mine. And so the queen, upon the following morning, asked her mare who was the fairest in the land. She was quite surprised. It said, inside the castle, you are the most beautiful there. But Snow White, living with seven little miners, her beauty is beyond the queen threw a fit, throwing things and smashing things until she realized that magic could gain her what her wiles had not. She pulled a crab apple from a nearby tree and began to cast spells upon it. When she was done, that withered crab apple had become a gorgeous, red and juicy, perfect fat apple, but its flesh was full of poison. Then she used magic to disguise herself as a withered old crone. She found the cottage where Snow White lived and began to call out, Fools for sale! Fresh, delicious apples for sale! Snow White came to the window and saw the crone hawking her apples. Then she saw the large ruby red apple in her head, in her hand. My apples are the best in the land, the withered crone said. Try one and see. Snow White took the delicious looking apple and took a bite. Before she could even swallow it, she fell down into an everlasting sleep. When the miners returned home and found her there, they could not bear to bury her and instead sealed her inside a glass coffin. The queen once more had her magic mirror tell her she was the fairest in the land. In a few short months, however, a prince went through the village on a hunting trip and saw the maiden encased in the glass coffin. He asked the miners about the woman and they told him that she was the rightful princess murdered by poison by the evil queen that ruled the land. And if there was a way to bring Snow White back, surely only the queen knew of it. The prince determined that he would visit the evil queen and learn if Snow White could be saved from her fate. When the prince arrived at the castle, the queen summoned her huntsman, but the, feet, but the prince defeated him easily. She called for the guard, but the prince laid them all low. The queen turned herself into a mighty dragon, but the prince fled into a nearby cave, its mouth almost covered in thorn bushes. The prince was able to maneuver around, around them to enter the cave. 
dragon, however, tried to force its head past the briars and was blinded by the thorn. Helpless, the queen resumed her own form and surrendered. She told the prince that only true love's first kiss would wake Snow White from her slumber. The prince ordered the queen incarcerated in the deepest dungeon of the castle. He went to the glass coffin and kissed Snow White, who spit the bite of apple she had taken out and wrapped her arms around the prince. The prince and Snow White were wed, and the queen was brought up from the dungeon to take part in the wedding before she was forced to put on iron shoes that had been heated in a fire and forced to dance until she fell down dead. Well, apparently they didn't all live happily ever after. Well, you know. Well, couldn't have happened to a nice whatever. A nicer evil queen? <laughs> a nicer queen in general. Like I said, nice or uh, whatever. So let's take a moment for Krista's Corner, and then we'll uh, look into the origins of Snow White. Uh, I Thank you for reading it. I think it was an interesting take on the tale. It's not just any corner. It's Krista's corner. Okay, I'm tired. How are you guys doing? Uh, I'm here. What do you have for us this week, Chris? It's been a long week so far. Mm -hmm. Um, today I wanted to sh tell you guys. First of all, um. We did, we finished the uh, book we were reading in English, uh -huh. and we did the slides today in class, uh -huh. so that was fun, cool. and I wanted to know if you guys would like me to read a bit. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> um, so our book was called The Poet X. Uh -huh. Um, start off, let's start off with the beginning. In the beginning of the book, we meet the main character and her mother. Her mother is extremely religious, and Ziamara is starting to question if she truly believes in it. In, in it any more. She's trying to, as hard as she can, to become her own person and no longer be stuck under her mother's thumb. Her, she goes to high school and wants a more in-depth way of looking at her feelings besides what she has found out about her deep about with her usual set people. Caridad, best friend, uh, Xavier, her brother, and her mom, and with the very differentiating mindset of the three kids around her. Mm -hmm. Middle summary. Ziamara starts to de de develop a crush on a person, Amon, in her science class, and is processing her feelings for him. She's trying to get more freedom from her mother. She tries to get it in several in several ways, like starting to date him on, uh, sneaking a uh, sneaking around without her knowing, not going to confirmation class at church anymore, and joining poetry club. Uh, Ziomara's mother finds her poetry journal. She sees everything in you know, everything her daughter has written about her, her boys, intimacy, religion, and her mother disagrees that ever with everything Ziomara has written. Uh, Ziamara's mother ends up hold on. Let me think about this. Burning the book. Yeah, I just started to fall back over. Ends up burning the book in front of her daughter. Or burning more of burning the journal. It's more of a journal than a book, but Uh, Ziamara ends up running away to Amon's house. Her teacher convinces her to go back and try to work through her problems with her mother. She heads back to the house, finding her to find her mother crying over the fact that she has left. Her and her mother agree to make amends. 
Ziomara then joins a poetry slam, having to build up the courage to perform in front of not just an audience, but her family as well. Uh, she performs, and her mother starts finally starts to agree with letting her do more things she wants, despite her disapproval. Wait, so you're disapproving? Huh? I was teasing. I I know you're not disapproving. I'm not disapproving. I am proven. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Um, but yeah, that's basically like the overview of it. Like we have, we did thirteen slides, but we only read three out loud each. Aha. Uh -huh. Um. Anyways, that's basically it for the just the book itself. I wanted to give you guys an overview because I'm not very good at like explaining things on my own. You did fine. I thought it was a. I thought it was good. I liked it. But um, back on the track to fairy tales. Um, I'd like to read this one called "The Six Swans" by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Grimm, and I'm pretty sure the the Grimm brothers is yes. one. Yes. Forgive, but the doctor just doesn't actually lines up with your dad's Yeah. Go. Yep. Okie dokie. <clears throat> Did I say the name of it? Yeah. Okay. Six swans. Yeah. A king was once hunting in a great forest, and he chased his prey so eagerly that none of his, his men could follow him. Uh, as evening approached, he stopped and looked around, and saw he was lost. He looked for, for a way out of the woods, but he could not find one. Then he saw an old woman with a bobbing head who approached. She was a witch. My dear woman, he said to her, can you show me the way through the woods? Oh, yes, your majesty, she answered. I can indeed. However, there is one condition, and if you do not fulfill it, you will never get out of these woods. And you will die, and will die here of hunger. What sort of condition is it? asked the king. I have a daughter, said the old woman, who is who is as beautiful as anyone you could find in all the world, and who well deserves to come, become your wife. If you make her your queen, I will show you show you the way out of your out of the woods. The king was so frightened. You did. Yeah, I'm great. The king was so frightened that he consented, and the old woman led him to. To her cottage, sorry, cat. That's okay. She she definitely wants to be in this episode, apparently. Apparently. She has come by and bugged mom, bugged me, bugged you. Definitely me. And now she's climbing on top of you as if to say, hey, let me talk. No, you're not talking, Jan. <clears throat> the old and the old little woman let her led him to her cottage where her daughter was sitting by a fire. She received the king as if she had been expecting him. He saw that she was very beautiful, but in spite of this, he did not like her, and he could not look at her without secretly shuddering. After he had lifted the girl onto his horse, the woman showed him the way, and the king arrived at his royal castle where the wedding was celebrated. The king had been married before, and by his first wife he had six children. The seven children, six boys and one girl. He loved them more than anything else in the world. Fearing that the stepwoman mother would not treat them well, even do them harm, he took them to a secluded castle, which stood in the middle of a forest. It was so well hidden, and was, and the way was so difficult to find that he himself would not have found it if a wise woman had not given him a ball of magic yarn, where whenever he threw it down in front of him, it would unwind itself and show him the way. That's handy. 
<clears throat> Indeed. However, the king went out to find his dear children so often that the queen took notice of his absence. She was curious and wanted to know what he was doing out there all alone in the woods. She gave a, gave a large sum of money to his servants, and they revealed the secret to her. They also told her about the ball of yarn, which could point out the way all by itself. She did not rest until she discovered where the king had kept the ball of yarn. Then she made some little shirts of white silk. Having learned the way of the art of witchcraft from her mother, she sewed a magic charm into each one. Into each one of them. Then one day, when the king had ridden out hunting, he took the little shirts and went into the woods. The ball of yarn showed her the way. <clears throat> the children, seeing that someone was approaching from afar, they thought it was their dear father coming to them. Full of joy, they ran to meet him. Then she threw one of the shirts over each of them, and when the shirts touched, when the shirts touched the ch touched their children, their when they touched the shirt. No. When okay. The shirt shirt touched touch their, their bodies, shoulders. Bodies. No, the, when the shirts touched their bodies, they were transformed into swans, and they flew away over the woods. The queen went home very pleased, believing she had gotten rid of her stepchildren. However, the girl had not run out with her brothers, and the queen knew nothing about her. The next day, the king went to visit his children, but find no one there. Girl, where are your brothers? asked the king. Oh, dear father, she answered. They have gone gone away and left me alone. Then she told him that from her window she had seen her, how her brothers had flown away over the woods as swans. She showed him the feathers that they had dropped into the courtyard and which she had gathered up. She gathered up. The king mourned, but he did not think that the queen had done this to him. Fearing that the girl was stolen away from him as well, he wanted to take her away with him, but she was afraid of her stepmother and begged the king to let her stay this, just this one more night in, in the castle in the woods. The poor girl thought, I, I can no longer stay here. I will go and look for my brother. And when night came, she ran away and straight and went straight into the woods. She walked the whole night long without stopping, and the next day as well, until she was too tired to walk any further. Then she saw a hunter's hut and went inside. She found a, a room with six little beds, but she did not dare get into one of them. Instead, she called a she crawled under one of them and lay down on the hard ground where she, she intended, intended to spend the night. The sun was about to go down when she heard rushing, the rushing sounds of and saw six swans fly through the window, landing on the floor. They blew on one another and blew all their feathers off. Their swan skins came off just like shirts. The girl looked at them and recognized her brother. She was happy and crawled out from the new set. The brothers were no less happy to see their little sisters, but happiness did not last long. You cannot stay here, they said to her. This is a robber's den. If they come and find you, they will murder you. Can't you protect me? asked the little sister. No, they answered. We can take off our swan skins for only a quarter hour. Only during that time do we have our human form. After that, we are again transformed to swan. Crying, the little sister said, Can you not be redeemed? Alas, no, they answered. The conditions are too difficult. You will not be allowed to speak or laugh for six years. And in that time, you would have to sew together six little shirts from Asher's for us. And if a single word were to come from your mouth, all your words would be lost. 
after the brothers had said this, before the council was beginning, and they flew out the windows again to Swan. Nevertheless, the girl firmly resolved, resolved to redeem her brothers, even if it would cost her her life. She left the hunter's hut, went to the middle of the woods, seated herself in a tree, and spent the spent, and there spent the night. The next morning, she went out, she gathered asters, and began to go. She could not speak with anyone. And she had no desire to laugh. She sat there, looking only at her work. After she had spent a long time there, it had happened that the king was, the king of the land was hunting in the wood, in these woods. His huntsmen came, huntsmen came to the tree where the girl was sitting. They called to her, saying, "Who are you?" But she did not answer. "Come down to us," they said. "We will not harm you." She only shook her head. When they got pre- when they pressed her with further questions, she grew she threw her golden necklace down at them, thinking that this would satisfy them. They, sh- they did not stop. So then she so she then drew her belt down down to down to them, and when this when this did not help her garters, and then one thing at a time, everything she had on she, and could do without. Until finally she had nothing left to her ship. The huntsmen, however, not letting themselves to be dissuaded, yeah. mm-hmm. this be dissuaded, climbed the tree, lifted the girl down, and took her to the king. The king asked, Who are you? What are you doing in this tree? But she did not answer. He asked her in every language that he knew, but she remained as speechless as a fish. Because she was so beautiful, the king's heart was touched, and he fell deeply in love with her. He put his cloak around her and lifted her onto his horse in front of himself and took her to his castle. There he addressed her in rich garments, and she glistened, and she glistened in her beauty like a day, like bright daylight, but no one could get a word to at the table, he seated by his, her by his side, and her modest manners and courtesy pleased him so much that he said, "My desire is to marry her and no one else in the world." A few days later, they were married. Now the king had a had a wicked mother who was dissatisfied with this marriage and spoke ill of the young queen. Who knows? She said. Everything okay over there? Everything's fine. Okie doke. Where the girl cannot speak comes from, she is not worthy of a king. A year later, after the queen had brought her first child into the world, the old woman took it away from her while she was asleep and smeared her mouth with blood. Then she went to the king and accused her of being a cannibal. The king could not believe this and would not allow anyone to harm her. She, however, sat the whole time sewing on her shirt and caring about caring for nothing else. The next time when she gave birth to a beautiful boy, the deceitful, the, the deceitful mother-in-law did the same thing, but the king could not bring himself to believe her accusation. He said she's too coyous and good to do anything like that. If she were not speechless and she could defend herself, her innocence would come to light. But when the old woman stole away newly born child for the third time and accused the queen, who did not defend herself with a single word, the king had no choice but to bring her to justice, and she was sentenced to die by fire. When the day came for the sentence to be carried about, it was also the day of the six years during which she had not been permitted to speak, speak or laugh, and she had thus delivered her brothers, her dear brothers, from the magic shirt. The six shirts were finished, only the sleeve of the last one was missing. When she led to the stake, she laid the shirts on her arm, standing there as the fire was set to light. She looked around and six arms came flying 
through the air, seeing that their redemption was near. Near. Her heart leapt with joy. <laughs> the swans watched for her, swooping down so she could throw the shirt, shirt over them. As soon as the shirt touched their swan swan skin, it touched them, their swan skin fell off, and her first shoot stood before her in their own body. Vigorous and handsome. <clears throat> However, the youngest was missing his left arm. In its place, he had a swan's wing. They embraced and kissed one another. Then the king, queen went to the king, who was greatly pleased when she began to sing, Here is my husband. Now I make thee need reveal to you that I am innocent. And falsely. Then she told them, him the treachery of the old women, the woman who had taken away their three children and hidden them. The king, then to the king's great joy, they were brought forth as one infant. The wicked mother-in-law was tied to the stake and burned to ashes, but the king and queen with their six with her six brothers, lived many long years in happiness and peace. Hi. Wow. That was a that was a deal. That was a story, and it was the story I I, I knew. So yeah, it's I, I it's an older fairy tale. I've ever heard that one from start to finish? I think I've heard like bits and pieces for similar. Yeah, things in other fairy tale countries. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I want to say it's a variation on the Swan Princess. Yeah, yeah, and that a far off variation, but that makes as much sense as anything. Sure. So let's talk about Snow White. Uh, Snow White first appeared, at least in written form, in an 1812 book of folk, folk tales, as written by the Brothers Grimm. It was in German, so the main character was called Schneewittchen, which is German for Snow White. It contained many of the things that it still contains in tellings today, including a magic mirror, a poisoned apple, a glass coffin, the evil queen, and the seven dwarves. It is a much older tale collected by the Grimm's for their book of fairy tales. However, the seven dwarves did not have names until Snow White was brought to Broadway almost a hundred years later. And then the characters' names were Blick, Flick, Glick, Snick, Click, Wick, and Quee. The Broadway show also named the evil queen Brangoma, named the huntsman Berthold, and the prince was Florimond of Caledon. Yeah. Uh, Snow White was played by a pop popular Broadway star named Marguerite Clark. I've heard of her before, I think. The Broadway show did such big business that it was made into a silent film in 1916, with Clark again in the starring role, where a certain 15-year-old Walt Disney saw it, and had the first inklings of recreating it in an animated form. And while his animated movie did not win an Academy Award for Best Music, it lost out to uh, 100 Men and a Girl, which sounds like an adult feature as opposed to a movie, but whatever. Uh, the year after, Shirley Temple gave Walt a special award featuring a regular size statue and seven miniature ones. Walt, of course, renamed the dwarves. Under Walt's guard, they were Dopey, Grumpy, Bashful, Sneezy, Happy, Sleepy, and Doc. It is possible that the story is based on a real event. In the 1550s, Philip II of Spain was supposedly in love with Countess Margarita von Waldeck. The von Waldeck family sequestered her first at her uncle's home, then later in the court of Mary of Hungary. Uh, Philip, of course, pursued, pursued her to both places. In 1554, uh, Margaretha wrote to family and friends of failing health and eventually died at the age of 21. Their relationship was doomed as Bar Margaretha was a Lutheran and Philip a Catholic, and the letters and other sources indicate that Margaretha was almost certainly poisoned to keep her away from Philip. 
and Margarita's father owned several copper mines, mostly worked by children, which due to malnutrition and poor working conditions were referred to as poor dwarfs. And these children lived in single room cottages, just like the dwarves from the story. The locals are so convinced that they are home to the true events of Snow White, they have changed their name from Bird for Height, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that white, to Sneewitchendorf, which means Snow White Village. In other versions of the story, Snow White takes ref refuge with robbers and bandits instead of dwarves. In other versions, instead of a forest, she finds an old haunted castle or a house on the seashore. Some versions have her poisoned with an enchanted dress her stockings, or poisoned flowers. In other versions, she travel, She is named Ermelina and Zerokashel, and she escapes the queen by riding an eagle, or traveling with fairies, or going to the moon. Uh, in the Scottish versions, yes, there is more than one Scottish version, the evil queen has a talking trout instead of a magic mirror, and in one version, Snow, uh, Snow White resides uh, with 13 cats who turn out to be a prince and his squires. Very big. That one. That sounds cool. Anyway. So that is what we know of the origin of Snow White. Snow White. That was pretty awesome. That's a lot of information. Yeah, and I had no idea that it, it's possible it was based on a real story, including dwarves. Well, Absolutely. well kind of. people. Kind of. So, uh, let's take a moment for a word from another podcast. Sounds good. Are you weird? Do you like spooky? Do your references always get a side eye from your parents, siblings, and best friends? Welcome home. Welcome home to the international podcast sensation Spine Chillers and Serial Killers. A show where three friends, Bex, Cash, and Evan talk about true crime and the paranormal but that's that's not all there's also laughter randomly singing and a slight struggle to pronounce words because well words are hard so come join us for spooky murdery stuff and a little bit of subject wandering while we're at it you can find us wherever you get your podcasts welcome, welcome to spine chillers and, and serial killers, killers. They sound like our kind of people, too. Yes. Yeah, they do. Right. A lot of the people that we promo on here sound like the kind of people we get along with. We kind of like, yep. We connect as podcasters at the very least. It's oh, true. well, I, I liked it so much that I think I'm going to take this next one. All right. Take away the Pinocchio. 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 Written by C. Colodi mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and appearing in the Italian Giornal dei Bambini. Thank you. Uh, mm. Children's magazine in English. Uh, in serial form, right? Yeah. yeah. Form, before being collected into a book in 1881, it is a story of a puppet that wants to be a real boy. Gepe Geppetto? Geppetto. Geppetto discovers an enchanted block of wood and decides to carve it into a puppet so he can make a living as a puppeteer. However, he carves the puppet, which he names Pino Pinocchio, obviously, it ab as he carves the pu puppet. Okay. Uh, it abuses the old man and eventually runs away from Geppetto. Geppetto chases after, after and seizes the puppet, but only to be arrested by the police who think he's kidnapping a child. Pinocchio returns to, Tibet, to Geppetto's home, where Geppetto's from, and talking cricket begins to scold Pinocchio for his behavior. Pinocchio stomps on the cricket, killing it. Whoa. Pinocchio begins to meet a variety, a variety of characters, all of whom are ne'er-do-wells. Ne'er-do-wells who lead him astray. Uh, two in particular are the fox and the and cat who hang Pinocchio. Wait. Yeah, 
Two. Yep. Okay. Who hanged Pinocchio to steal gold coins that Pinocchio was given for Geppetto. Unable to find said coins, and seeing a fairy approaching, they flee. The fairy saves Pinocchio and takes him to live with her. She had ruled him in, in twice. One time, he runs afoul of the fox uh, and cat who swindle him out of Geppetto's gold. And another time, he gets turned into a donkey. Whoa. Um, it is w- when he lives with the fairy that fairy with the fairy he discovers that his nose grows when he lies. He attempts to lie about the missing gold, and his nose betrays him. He leaves the fairy and gets involved with his more adventures when he becomes swallowed by a great shark. In the shark's belly, he discovers adventure. Wait, no. He discovers Geppetto. Geppetto got swallowed by the great shark. This is insane, guys. I haven't, I obviously haven't watched enough Pinocchio, I think. Obviously. Pinocchio rescues his father and begins to take care of him. When he is revisited by the fairy, who make him into a real boy. Okay, I think we need to give Krista a, a minute to digest this. Maybe we should take a moment to get the popcorn. Sure, that sounds good to me. I feel like I've been reading. And I also feel sponsored. Excellent. So Pinocchio, like a lot of other Tuscan fairy tales, contains a lot of moral lessons for children. Uh, Among others, they include lying doesn't pay, it's always best to behave, and shirking your duties leads to bad end. An English language, language virgin... Sorry, that again. An English language version appeared towards the end of the 1890s, and Pinocchio became a beloved fairy tale and was eventually adapted by Walt Disney. Once again, Disney turns up and again, the same episode. Imagine that. I had no idea. Who introduced yeah, Jiminy cool. Cricket to the world in the animated movie, and the shark became a whale. Uh, The 1940 Disney film is quickly and easily identified classic, and much of the modern tellings come from this cartoon. One other thing, C. Colodi, when he originally wrote it, he ended the story after Pinocchio was hung. Mm -hmm. That was the end of the story as far as he cared. Oh, well, we're done. And uh, the, the, the people who ran the magazine and several other people were like, no, no, people love this story. You have to bring him back. You you have to tell more. And so he, that that's, yeah, he told more and Pinocchio became a real boy. I don't think it would have gotten uh, Disney's attention if it didn't end that well. Yeah. Also, um, Jiminy Cricket got a better ending in the, in the, in the animated movie than it did in this story. <laughs> <laughs> Instantly. All right. Shall I take the next one? You shall take the next one. All righty. So now let's talk about Hansel and Gretel. Once upon a time, a woodsman was raising two children, all alone since his wife had passed. The woodsman met and married a beautiful lady who did not care for the children. The lady insisted the woodsman take his children into the woods and leave them there. However, Hansel, the little boy, had overheard the woman and had stuffed his pockets with rocks and created a trail. So when Dad left them in the woods, they simply followed the trail home. Angry, the woman insisted again that the woodsman lead his children into the woods and leave them there. This time, the woman made sure that each child didn't have anything more than a crust of bread for their walk. But Hansel broke up his crust of bread, and so when his father left them, he began to follow the trail home, only to discover that birds had eaten the crumbs, so their trail was gone. Hansel 
bravely led his sister through the woods, eventually coming to a house made of cake, sugar, and sweets. Unable to resist, the children begin nibbling on the house until its occupant, an old witch, emerged. She ushered the children into the house before locking Hansel in a cage. She fed Hansel and Gretel each day, and each day she had Hansel stick a finger out so she could see how fat he was getting. Hansel, however, he was a smart boy, he realized that the old witch could not see very well. And so instead of giving him her finger, instead of giving her his finger, he stuck, he stuck out a stick. Finally, the witch decided that, fat or not, it was time to eat Hansel. As since she had taken them in, she ordered Gretel to help her around the kitchen. And when the old woman opened her oven in hopes it would be warm enough to cook in, Gretel pushed the old witch inside, grabbing her key. She then freed her brother and the two stole the old witch's treasure. They returned home eventually to find that their father had sent the woman he married away and the three of them lived happily ever after. I don't know if this is me having some sort of fever dream, but like I think I remember a Mickey and Minnie Mouse like animation version of that. Probably. That was like very similar. Hansel and Gretel has been redone multiple, multiple times. Yes, many times. All right, let's take a moment for another word from our sponsors. Okay. Yes. Awesome. And it was a very interesting sponsor. Cool. Okay. Uh, the tale almost certainly existed before the Brothers Grimm published it. It contains many tropes common to fairy tales, including the show me how. Uh, the show me how is just a, a, a scene in which uh, one character has another character show them how to do something and uses that moment to trick that character. Yeah. Uh, in this case, when the witch asks Gretel, Gretel to test that the oven is ready, Gretel says she doesn't know how. Thus, when the witch bends over to check the oven, she pushes her in. Uh, and it also has making a trail, which has uh, appeared in other fairy tales and fables, going all the way back to the thread Perseus used to escape the miniature's, Minotaur's labyrinth. If it was an original story, many folklorists believe it was pieced together from other stories. In some tales, the woman insisting the children leave is their mother, while in most she is a stepmother. One of the most widely adapted fairy tales, it has been a cartoon featured on stage and screen, even given a more serious treatment with Hansel and Gretel Rich, Witch Hunters, which starred Jeremy Renner. Uh, it also appeared with Ricky Schroeder in the role of Hansel and Joan Collins playing both the stepmother and the witch in Shelley Duvall's fairy tale theater. And that was around 1980-ish. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rick Schroeder was right age for that part, and Joan Collins would have made a great witch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that's all she played, really. Uh, now, we covered her companion series, Tall Tales and Legends, in the Pecos Bill episode, if you yeah. remember. Uh, curiously, the Russians tell a variation of this tale with Baba Yaga as the old witch. Nice. So here for me, it's like I feel like this witch, and like who is it? Like the mom, the stepmom, the one that keeps kicking them out. I yeah, feel like they could have been starving. Is. They found their house, and then the the the, the mom well, and that is how a lot out. of the stories go. That is how a lot of the Ansel and Gretel stories go. It's similar to how um. Jack and the Beanstalk, where they don't have any money. They don't have any money for food. And so the mom and dad say it's not, you know, the mom says, you got to take them because we're going to starve. 
we're all going to starve. So if you get rid of them, at least there'll be enough food for just you and me. Yeah. And so that is, that's kind of, he'll take a lot of do on it. So. Yeah, I just, as soon as I heard that part, I'm just like, hmm. Yeah, I think they're starving. I think they're starting to have some hallucinations because they're starting to starve to death. Uh, and like I said, that this tale they say they they think it's put together from parts of other tales. They don't think it's an original story, and if it is, then it's probably a lot different because, like I said, a lot of tropes have been worked into this, like the th- like the 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 trail which in this case is bread comes, crumbs and rocks. Uh, but, you know, magic thread has been used in other things. Yeah. So. Bjorn in her, in her story. Right, right, right. Well, that's the thing. A lot of these have things that will appear over and over again. Um, probably the one that has the fewest is Pinocchio. But, I mean, that was a written, serialized story by an author. Uh, so yeah, um, and I, I've got to say, I like it when we do these episodes. I think they're fun. Um, people don't realize. Yeah, and like I always learn something in these episodes. I never knew. Like I never knew that uh, Snow White might have been based off of a real story. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think that either. I. I just genuinely thought it was a made-up story, but the fact that it said, like, hey, this could be real. I mean, I feel like I've heard it somewhere before, but, it's like, I... See, and that's my whole thing, you guys. That's I keep coming back to this week after week, and it's, like, I feel like at some point in time, some of the stories that we have may have really happened, and history just didn't Watch that. Like you think about all the things. There's we a lot of things that history. You think about all of the things that we see on the news and stuff now. In the 1500s, 1600s, they didn't have news. They didn't have mail that could go across the ocean, you know. And so, how much, how many stories have been lost to time that we just? Oh, I'm sure there's many. I mean, so, you know, look that's back. my whole thing. I just it always circles back to that for me. And and I don't know how literate the average person was in the 1500s. Right, so exactly most. But, and, and and they certainly didn't have access to books because, I mean, yeah. books were not common objects even then. And making stories before writing them. So. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm just saying. That people didn't have books where they could sit down and read a story. So they would tell each other stories. And a lot of the stories started with a kernel of truth. And then they just went on to get crazy. <laughs> Some more crazy than others. Right, Fair right. Um, I do like the fact that that all these stories have been mined in some way or another. Um, I would... Li- I would, I'm, how to put this? I'm a bit surprised there is no long cartoon for Hansel and Gretel from Disney. It seems like something that, that they would do. Especially in this day. I mean, they've done, they've done Hansel and Gretel stuff. They've I done remember the story watching. in multiple different ways. I want to say silly symphonies did a Hansel and Gretel. Or several different versions of Hansel and Gretel. Um, so, I mean, Disney has told that story multiple times. It's just not something that they ever picked up for a full length feature. Yeah. I think in the one that I remember, they weren't like running away from someone. They were trying to find a place to stay because they were like trapped mm-hmm. in the woods. And that is something else. Uh, I, I said that uh, the that Baba Yaga is, is in a Russian version of the tale. Uh, by that I mean Baba Yaga, the actual uh, fictional uh, fable character yeah. that lives in the house that has stands on giant chicken legs and yeah, uh, yeah the this not 
uh, Keanu Reeves as a former assassin that used to work for the restaurant mom. Well, because the John Wick movies, his n nickname was Baba Yaga. Because it was the Russian's name for the boogeyman. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, um, but I just, I love doing these episodes. I didn't think I would. When you first suggested, I didn't think I, I would. But one, they're amazing episodes and you learn so much from doing them. Two, like... I didn't know Pinocchio was a, a serialized story, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's just so much you learn. Like, And unlike the, the Brothers Grimm, who adapted a lot of tales that people were telling, mm -hmm. uh, C. Colota wrote his own original story, hence, you know, stomping on Jiminy Cricket and hanging Pinocchio. Yeah, it's kind of hardcore. Yeah. Well, apparently Tuscans like stories like, you did bad, so bad things happen to you. Makes sense. And it was only the influence of others that were like, no, no, bring him back, redeem him. People like this character. God, that's TV to the end of the night. Yep, yep. Not a lot of final thoughts and summary for this episode. Summering it all the way through because it's like we told the tale and then you kind of broke it down for us. Yeah. yeah. If that didn't happen, I mean, we'd be to the end. Like... Right. Well, and I, I just always think it's a good idea to take time at the end of the show for, hey, I learned something, or hey, this is this reminds me of this or that or the other. Oh, for sure. And uh, and and the other thing to me is like. These episodes kind of weirdly mirror a lot of our paranormal episodes. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it's the same kind of word of mouth tale. Well, and I like that we keep ending up crisscrossing on stories that we've already done. Like yeah. talking about the series that Shelley Duvall did. And... Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, that was a great show, and I'm sure you can find it on uh, YouTube, almost certainly, because it was a Showtime thing, I want to say. Yeah. Anyway, um, thanks to all of you who listen for listening. We so appreciate it. Uh, thanks for keeping us in the Good Pods Top 100. Uh, thanks to those of you that are in our Facebook group, and if you're not in, please join. Oh my God, there there is such a great fun in there oh. yeah one of our one of our listeners dropped it and i know how you like puns i do love me some puns i gotta get over the facebook group um but yeah it's uh, uh someone had suggested that the picture i used which is actually a picture of snee Witchendor, snow white village uh -huh. uh, that it was a picture of medusa and a bunch of gnomes and someone responded like with gnome, I don't think so, or 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 it was, but it was it was that sort of play on words. Yeah, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. And uh, go check that out. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah. So thank you all for being active in there. Uh, thanks to Bill Barrent, uh, that last name spelled B E H R E N D T. Uh, Bill does our theme music. Bill is obviously a musician, so if you need music for a project or someone to perform at a function, Bill's your guy. You can reach him at Bill Barron at sbcglobal.net. Thanks also goes to Paige Elmore, formerly of the Reverie Crime Podcast. Uh, Paige, in addition to being a kick-butt podcaster, he also has a Canva addiction, which he combines with our own Christus artwork to make logo art for us, so thank you, Paige. Thanks to Aaron Gnurk of the Big Dumb Fun Show for continuing to promote us locally. Please, once again, join our Facebook group. And this episode grew out of a Laura idea, as does our next one, as we look into King Shi, the Chinese Pirate Queen. I'm so excited to talk about this chickpea. She sounds so cool. She, she is pretty bad, bad mamma jamma. Oh my god, I've already done the research on it, and She's interesting. That yes, not so yours, queen. Yes, queen. 
Mba. Ba. Bye.